Welcome to everyone. Um, first thing, this is part of the King's Forum on International Dispute Resolution. It is part of a series of talks. Uh, the next one is going to be next week on recent developments in the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. We're going to have a judge from that tribunal here, Rüdiger Wolfram, who's going to report on recent developments. We already had a couple of events this term, and for those who have missed them, we are filming them and putting the films online. We currently have two events that have been put online. Uh, one was on recent developments in international criminal law by two distinguished Queen's Councils, and uh, one was on human rights in Mexico by the head of the Mexican Legal Research Institute at UNAM, our partner university there. Today, we have a wonderful panel on a, a fairly recent event, and I'll spend very little time introducing the speakers, very little because for most of you, they won't need any introduction. Uh, our main speaker today is Erika de Wett. Uh, Erika has never taken the simple path to anything. She has written a Habilitationsschrift that became quite popular on uh, public international law. She is a professor at the University of Pretoria. She was a professor at the University of Amsterdam. She is also a professor at the University of Bonn. And like all the speakers on the panel, I admire her very much. I admire her because I don't know how she does it, but whenever you email her and you know she is writing at the same time five articles, she will answer immediately. She organizes every event impeccably, absolutely astonishing. Uh, our two other speakers today, Dire Tladi, who is also a professor at the University of Pretoria, he is also a member of the International Law Commission. And, as I found out fairly recently, he is also author of a novel. Apparently he does not sleep, or there must be some problem in South Africa in that nobody there sleeps and they get 24 hours to work a day. Laurent Bartels, from the University of Cambridge, distinguished author of a report on the Sadiq Tribunal, which we will probably hear more about today. He is an expert on WTO law, a field that I also very much like, and surprisingly, wherever I read anything about the field, he has already been there. He has already written about that. I don't know how he does that either. We are very, very fortunate today to also uh, have Sir Francis Jacobs here, who agreed to say a couple of words on the past of the tribunal. Sir Francis Jacobs, I think, needs no introduction to anyone. Advocate General at the European Court of Justice, and we have all read his opinions and have been influenced by them very much. Uh, I'm very grateful. I'm also very grateful for the presence of someone from the South African Embassy. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion that we're going to have on the topic. Erika? Thank you. Um, Dean Karen uh, Holger, thank you so much for this wonderful invitation in this wonderful city. And it's a privilege to be here and with these distinguished colleagues. I have been given 30, 35 minutes. I'll try not to overstep the time so that we have sufficient time for discussion and for comments. I will briefly introduce the SADC Tribunal, talk about its composition, uh, what, how its rise and its decline, and also about some of the ongoing events and challenges at the moment and the legal implications of, of those developments, some of which are also not quite clear to me, but fortunately for that reason, we have several other experts in the room who can then uh, uh, complement what I'm, what I'm saying. Now, the Southern African Development Community was formally established in 1992 in Windhoek in Namibia. Now that was at a time when things in South Africa was also finally changing. Apartheid was not formally abolished yet. It was before the, the first democratic elections, but things were moving in the right direction. And the SADC was replacing the Southern African Development Coordination Conference, which was established in 1980 mainly by the frontline states, the states which were the most directly affected around South Africa, and it was intended to make them economically less dependent from South Africa at the time. But now the times were changing, 
This is also the end of the Cold War uh, in the early 1990s. I think it was a very different time. There was a window of opportunity on, on many levels. If one thinks this was just well, it was around the time of the Iraq, the first Iraq war, the Gulf War. There was better cooperation between the former <coughs> Eastern Blocs and the Western Blocs, and there was this, this hope also for a new future on the continent and for, uh, uh, better cooperation and economic development in Southern Africa as such. It has its headquarters in Botswana, Gaborone, 14 members and not unproblematic composition if you keep in mind the linguistic and, and historical differences between some of the countries. You also have the DRC as a member, Francophone and involved in, in, in civil war and conflict, military conflict now for quite, quite some years. And then you have the Lusophone countries, Mozambique and Angola as well, uh, and the other countries all English speaking. Now, SADC is aimed at economic integration and development through guaranteeing democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. This is included in the, in the preamble, but it is first and foremost a, a regional community aimed at improving economic integration. Now, one should keep in mind that this was also at a time when the European Union was just really getting going and having a spillover effect on other regions. And this is, I think, also problematic in southern Africa and Africa in a whole, as a whole. And we can also, it would be interesting to hear what, what my colleagues think of this, but that we tend to take over or copy these Western-style models for economic integration without necessarily thinking through what it implies, whether we are ready for copying these kind of models in the same kind of way. Now, Articles 4 and 6 became very important, ultimately, in the rise and decline of the SADC Tribunal. They emphasize that the community and the member states have to act in accordance with human rights, democracy, and the rule of law, but without spelling out listing the individual rights. The only right, human right that was actually spelled out in more detail is in Article 6, determining that SADC and the member states shall not discriminate against any person on grounds of gender, religion, political views, race, ethnic origin, culture, uh, ill health, disability, and so on. And this became also the linchpin for the Campbell case, which was the case that led to all the uproar. Now here we have a picture of the tribunal in Ventuk. This was the former judge, because the, the tribunal is the chief justice, Pillay. Now, the SADC Treaty itself made explicit provision for the creation of a, a tribunal, but the exact details and the scope of, of, and the functions and jurisdiction and so on was spelt more explicitly in the protocol on the tribunal and the rules of procedure, which were adopted in August 2000. The judges were appointed in 2005, but they, the court actually became defunct by 2010. It was formally suspended in 2012, but it had a short life. Now, by the time that it was suspended, uh, it had handed down 19 decisions, and there were other cases languishing and still languishing and and that's part of where what's one of the challenges that we are facing now is concerns the fallout of some of those cases that were just stopped before they have actually been decided now 11 of these cases concern Zimbabwe uh, eight of which concern the land grabbing policies of President Mugabe and all of them were related to the so-called Campbell case, to which I'll come back in a minute. And then, very importantly, there were also five decisions that concerned internal termination, uh, 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 um, termination of employment of SADC employees. Because, very important, the jurisdiction 
of the tribunal applied to interstate disputes. It applied also to disputes between SADC and individuals. And it had exclusive jurisdiction, and I'm coming back to that, over disputes between SADC and its employees. Many other in, uh, international organizations you have, the United Nations has, has its own administrative type tribunal and many other organizations are affiliated with the ILO administrative tribunal. And in the case of SADC, the SADC tribunal also it was the only avenue for judicial review f relating to f in employment disputes within the organization. Now, important is also Article 21B of the Protocol to uh, the Tribunal that con concerns the sources of law. So when SADC, the Tribunal, takes decisions, uh, it actually interpreted the SADC Treaty, but could also take note of applicable treaties, in other words, treaties ratified by the relevant states in front of it, general principles of law and rules of public international law. Now, I think, Laurent, you felt that Article 21B actually goes beyond the, con uh, the uh, Article 38.1C systemic integration principle that is typical of public international law, namely that when you interpret a treaty as a tribunal, you can take note of other relevant treaties to which that state in front of you is a party. Uh, um, it perhaps elaborates on that principle, but this, the idea as such is not unknown to public international law. It's harmonious interpretation and systemic integration. Now, something which was quite interesting and played out very interestingly also on the national level in South Africa, and I'm not sure that I will have time to go into that into detail, but is the impact of the enforcement clause in the treaty itself. Now, Article 32 of the pro protocol determined that the rules of civil procedure for the registration and enforcement of foreign judgments in force in the territory uh, shall be applicable. Decisions of the tribunal were binding on the parties. Uh, they were enforceable within the territories of the states concerned, which played a which had interesting consequences because it was interpreted to mean all states of SADC. So it's binding on the case, on the state in question or the states in question, but could in principle be enforced in all the SADC parties in as far it was, as it was relevant and in accordance with the rules of civil procedure for the restoration and enforcement of foreign judgments. So you had to, and this was, Odd, because you're dealing with a binding decision of an international tribunal, but it had to be enforced as if it were a foreign judgment, a judgment handed down by another state, which is something we know very well in, in conflicts of law. But it's a bit odd in relation to um, international decisions by international courts. And this had consequences when the case was actually enforced or re uh, when it was attempted to enforce this case in Zimbabwe. Now, the, the Mike Campbell saga was concerned the land grabbing pra practices of President Mugabe in Zimbabwe where the Zimbabwean constitution was changed in a way to allow for large-scale expropriation of land that belonged uh, uh, mainly to white landowners at the time without compensation and without any access to judicial review. This is an incredibly sensitive issue in a, in a continent where it's the land and the, the need to redistribute land is highly relevant, it's, it's highly emotionalized. Mr. Campbell himself had a problematic history. He was fighting in the Rhodesian War at the time on the wrong side. So he was not necessarily a sympathetic figure, but the fact is that he, his land was expropriated along with uh, the land of 78 other co-complainants. 
without any recourse to a court of law or compensation. And what was also problematic is that the land was not actually distributed in a way that uh, advantaged poor people or poor Zimbabweans, uh, black Zimbabwean farmers who uh, were in need of farming land, but it was redistributed to some of the friends and close allies of President Mugabe. So th there was that element as to what happened with the land, which was to, which could be expropriated in the public interest, but then in the end went to a, a group of close-knit friends. Now, the right to property isn't provided or guaranteed in the SADC treaty. The linchpin for this case was non-discrimination, Article 6, because the argument was that uh, Article 4 and 6 of the treaty itself guaranteed human rights, in particular also uh, uh, non-discrimination, and the way in which this land was expropriated without compensation uh, in practice actually targeted white farmers. And what the tribunal then did was it relied on treaties which Zimbabwe itself had ratified, such as the treaty uh, the United Nations Treaty on Racial Discrimination and other treaties in which, that spelled out in more detail what non-discrimination implied and actually concluded that it wasn't in the expropriation as such that was the problem, but the way it was done, the lack of compensation, the fact that the, the land also ended up with uh, close allies, allies of Mugabe, and 14 to 1 did or oh, 13 to 1 determined that there was indeed discrimination, which I think in the context was an extraordinary decision, given the volatility of the, the, emotion, the emotions surrounding uh, the land grabbing practices, the persona of Campbell, what he represented uh, in relation to colonialism. But it was felt by the majority of judges that, that he was unfairly treated. What I never understood in this case is why nobody ever bothered also to make a case for, uh, it, w it was about the landowners, but their workers, nobody seemed to be concerned about them because they lost everything as well. Many of them lived on the farms, they lost their livelihoods, their jobs, their property, but there was only a concern in these cases with the landowners as such and not with the workers, which I think also rings, you know, with, it's, it's, which I found problematic, that nobody seemed to want to include them in the case as well. The upshot of this was that Zimbabwe in particular was very upset with the result. It didn't accept it and lobbied very effectively for the, with other states for this, the de facto suspension of the tribunal. Uh, the, uh, the, the SADC summit then decided to, uh, in, in, in various successive decisions that the tribunal should not accept new cases, that judges whose terms had expired should not be reappointed, and they also stopped paying the judges. So effectively the court couldn't function. Now, of course the states, according to the treaty also at the time and the protocol, could terminate if the states wanted to terminate the tribunal, they could do so. But one would argue that they should obviously follow the procedures provided for in the, in the protocol itself. And I initially argued, and I'm struggling now with this because I actually, it was pointed out to me by several colleagues that maybe the suspension as such wasn't really illegal. It was, it's true that the states didn't follow the procedure but they consented, all member states consented to the suspension. So you could argue that through subsequent practice and consensual behavior by all the state parties, they introduced a new procedure for suspension and abolition of the tribunal. It was acquiesced in and consented to by all of them. So one could argue that effectively this decision of the summit to suspend the tribunal and create a new tribunal and a, a, new, a new treaty that would redefine the powers of the tribunal was in that sense uh, a new, 
a new procedure for amendment which replaced what was initially in the treaty. My sense of fairness and justice is still outraged by this, but I do think from the perspective of treaty law, this argument can be made. I think politically it's incredibly irresponsible because why it, it, it doesn't to, to go about it in this way because you do not encourage investment uh, if you give the impression that if you don't like the outcome of a decision and it doesn't suit you, then you just don't follow the rules anymore. It's not good for legal certainty and for encouraging uh, investor confidence. Having said that, I'm not sure that one, it's that easy to make a clear-cut case that the suspension as such was illegal. And I'm sure my colleagues will have a lot to say about that, amongst other things. Um, so, in short, a new protocol on the tribunal was adopted in August of last year. It will only have interstate uh, jurisdiction, disputes among states, and advisory opinions can be requested by the summit, and it can only apply the SADC treaty and the protocols according to Article 35. However, still, if there is an interstate dispute, the, it's a basic principle of treaty law in light of Article um, 38.1c uh, of the ICJ statute that the tribunal will still, as a, a general principle of international law, be able to consider other relevant treaties uh, in the dispute, but obviously it would only consider an interstate dispute. This protocol has not yet entered into force. It requires ratification of two-thirds of the member states. So I quickly calculated, which is not my strong point, and think, well, that probably requires 10 states then of the 14. Uh, we're not there yet, so we don't actually have anything. It's not there. There's nothing, which is a problem on many levels because you have a, various additional protocols to the SADC Treaty that deals with specific issues, trade issues. Into, uh, we will hear later tonight probably about the, the FIP, the Financial Investment Protocol. There's, there are, there's the Women's Protocol and so on. And these specific issue-related, topic-related protocols determine that if there is a dispute, then at some point that dispute can go to the tribunal. But now there isn't a tribunal, so where do they go? Now... And not to mention the problems that we are having with employ disgruntled employees, which no have nowhere to go either if their contracts of employment have been terminated. They found their way to the Botswana High Court, which I knew was going to happen, and I, uh, it filled me with glee that it happened, but I have to confess also that long term I don't think that that is necessarily the best solution to place the poor Botswana High Court in that kind of position, you know, to, to have to lift immunity every time to deal with these kind of issues. The tension between that court and the SADC organs and so on is, is also, in the long run, I don't think helpful for the functioning of the organization. Now then, all kinds of things happen on the international level. Dire said to me earlier today, he's so tired of NGOs and you know, all the things <laughs> that they're up to. Um, to me, it depends on what they're up to. I don't agree with everything that they're doing, but these kind of cases I felt were... <sighs> I, I'm glad that they are annoying the governments, but I don't think these cases were well argued and that they, the, the right legal strategy were followed with, with many of them. Now, there was a complaint before the African Commission that was uh, that concerned, it was, it was driven by Zimbabweans and Zimbabwean lawyers against SADC and the member states and claimed that they violated the right to access to courts in Article 7 and and 26 of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. Now, it's obvious that the African Commission doesn't have any jurisdiction over SADC as an organization. It's not a member, so, you know, that was a no-brainer. Then the question was, okay, so in what way here did the states who are parties to the African Charter violate the 
African Charter by conniving to abolish the protocol. Now, formally, if one accepts that now that protocol has been actually, uh, the tribunal has been abolished by the SADC summit through the procedure which the states designed in practice, if one accepts that, then it means SADC abolished the tribunal, not the states. But can one then attribute that decision parallel to the states? No. I think the African Commission correctly determined that these days you can't just say, well, the organization did it, it's nothing to do with the states. You can have parallel attribution. Article 61 of the Dario also mentions that, but there are conditions attached, attached to that. The international organization has to have competence in the particular area, which I think one can organize it had. Then the states must actually have you know, influence the organization, which I think to take that decision, which I think they also did. But then, and this was problematic here, you have to pr indicate that what states are doing here is they're trying to use the organization to circumvent some obligations under international law, which they have. So if they had done this themselves, abolishing the tribunal, it would have been illegal in international, under international law, in this instance, violating the right to access to courts in the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. Um, but now they're trying to get the organization to do this exactly because the commission doesn't have jurisdiction over, the, uh, over SADC. But the African Commission, I think rightly, sadly, but rightly, concluded here, no. The specific rights in question here, access to, to courts concerns national courts, concerns national remedies. And I think if you look at how the African Charter is framed, I, I do agree with them. I don't think that anything in the African Charter or the ICCPR, for that matter, obliges states to provide remedies on international level. It concerns access to national remedies. I think a better approach would have been to make a case of the African Commission against Zimbabwe, where clearly there has been a denial of access to courts on the national level um, in, the, in, in this situation because there was expropriation without compensation and access to justice, and the Zimbabwean courts have also refused to enforce the decision of, of the SADC tribunal. The African, there was also an advisory opinion submitted, oh, just the previous slide. Uh, I think, oh, the mm. previous one. Previous, okay. There was a question, uh, advisory opinion submitted to the African Court on Humans and People's Rights, but that was declared inadmissible. This was also done very clumsily because the, the African Court cannot deal with a question which is also pending before the Commission. So this should really not have been submitted at that point in time. Okay, do I think I have another 10 minutes or okay. I, I don't want to go on too long? Okay. Seven, I'll try and do this in seven. So, um, the, 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 uh, this is, of course, an attempt to create pressure on the states to reinstate a tribunal with also access, uh, which is accessible to individuals. Because one has to keep in mind here that no state until this point in time has actually made use of the SADC tribunal. All the claims that have been submitted and all the cases came from individuals. The interstate uh, 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 avenue has not been used. What has, however, also happened, because now there was no avenue anymore for disgruntled employees, and they went to the uh, Botswana High Court. And several of us have said at the time, look, this is going to happen, and there, there, are, uh, there are precedents in Europe, the Wait and Kennedy analogy, where the European Court of Human Rights made clear that if an international uh, a member state, in that case it was Germany, which hosted the European Space Agency, if the European Space Agency doesn't have 
uh, uh, judicial review procedures that is equivalent to what the German courts would offer the employees of, of that international organization, then you cannot really acknowledge immunity. I'm, 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 I'm now summarizing it a bit clumsily, but the point is that the immunity of the international organization in a member state can only be upheld as long as that organization provides equivalent judicial protection for its employees. Now, in that case, it was decided that the European Space Agency actually did provide for sufficient alternative uh, equivalent judicial protection, but the case had a spillover effect and there were cases in Belgium and in France where the immunity of international organizations were lifted because there wasn't within the organization sufficient equivalent judicial protection. Now, of course, Botswana is not a, a party to the European Convention, but it is a party to the ICCPR and the African Charter uh, to Human and People's Rights. So there's a nice, there's nice scope for analogy here. Cross-fertilization human rights jurisprudence, which courts sometimes like to do. But the, the Botswana court actually did lift immunity implicitly but it didn't even address the issue of immunity of SADC, which is spelled out in the SADC treaty and in a whole protocol specifically dealing with uh, privileges and immunities. It just said, listen, there was a denial of justice. Everybody agrees about that. SADC acknowledged that there's nowhere that these people can go anymore. Uh, we regard it as a pub according to Botswana law. SADC and what it does resembles a public body without really spelling out what a public body is. But it's kind of state-like you know, work, and they have to provide judicial review for their employees, and it wasn't, so we're doing it. Um, which, of course, is not a very, con from the perspective of international law, an argument which is a bit thin. On the merits, however, they found that this particular employee, Ms. Swart, was not unfairly treated. So, you know, the, the SADC didn't, the point was made, you need to provide judicial review, otherwise we're going to do it. But on the facts, actually, the, uh, the complaint was rejected. Now, my, my, uh, uh, an interesting situation that is currently ongoing concerns the financial and investment protocol. And there's arbitration going on uh, concerning this. Deray, I don't know to what extent you're actually allowed to say much about this, but the Swiss Borough Diamond Mines company actually had a case pending before the tribunal. It concerned expropriation of Mr. Van Sale, who tried his luck in all the courts, the Lesotho courts, the South African courts, which rejected him. Uh, he, he tried a diplomatic protection claim there that wasn't going anywhere, uh, but he was, he was expropriated in the context of the Lesotho Highland Water Scheme, which is a joint venture with South Africa, and he felt ill-treated, and the case was pending before the SADC tribunal, and then the tribunal was abolished. So, well, Mr. Von Sale, uh, Mr. Swiss Bureau, the company actually had a point. I mean, th this financial investment protocol provides for disputes to be uh, dealt with by the tribunal, but arbitration is also an option. So, once the tribunal was abolished, uh, an arbitration panel was actually instituted. But what I cannot get my mind around, because the, 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 fa I mean, the information concerning the arbitration is, is confidential, is what exactly is, what is at, at stake here? I, because my understanding is that he's also claiming that Lesotho has denied, has been com complicit in a denial of justice towards him. Is that part of the, the claim? And I'm trying to get, I, I, I would be very happy if that were the case, but once again, I'm not entirely sure what the primary obligation is that is being violated here. I don't like it when you smile like that because I'm not <laughs> usually on the side of the state here. So maybe somebody else in the room can come up with, with a good counter argument, but I, I, I don't really know where this is going. Meanwhile, in the South African courts, I'm, I, I'm going to skip the whole issue of the, the Campbell case was unsuccessfully, uh, they couldn't register it in Zimbabwe. 
And if there are questions, we can discuss this during the discussion, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into this now. It was then very successfully enforced in the South African courts. Uh, and I think well argued, it was argued that there was no immunity here uh, on the part of Zimbabwe because through accepting the protocol and the enforcement procedures in the protocol, they actually waived their uh, right to immunity. The attachment that was made here was, I mean, it was in a way symbolic. Zimbabwean property used for private commercial purposes in Cape Town was actually attached. It could never compensate for all the losses, but it was kind of symbolic. Uh, there was a very good judgment by the Supreme Court of Appeal on, on this, which was in, in a way endorsed also by the Constitutional Court, emphasizing also our openness to public international law, uh, the, the importance of access to justice, and that the enforcement of this decision, all things considered that we ratified uh, uh, the protocol and the treaty, that there was the specific Article 32 provision that provided for enforcement in the member states meant that we really had to give effect to that. I think that that was kind of okay. But now there's currently another case pending by the Law Society of South Africa, which uh, is trying to piggyback on the Campbell decision. And its, it's argument is, well, now look, we've also connived in abolishing, South Africa's connived in abolishing the old tribunal with access to individuals, and it's now also supported this whole new procedure, the treaty making that adopted the new protocol that has access, gives access only to states, but that this whole procedure was unconstitutional. Now this is a stretch. And the thing is they're arguing the unconstitutionality of the president's participation in a decision to oust the SADC tribunal's jurisdiction. <clears throat> Based on violation of access to justice, the fact that there was no prior consultation with parliament and so forth. <laughs> and one thing that I do think can be constitutionally problematic, I wish I can, but I, I'm not a constitutional lawyer anymore and I, I'm not sure that this argument is going to hold, but there is a revocation of vested rights because you are dealing here with pending, pending claims before a tribunal. I, I cannot see how our constitution can forbid the president, unfortunately, to revoke international, to revoke our support for international complaints proceedings. I, I don't see the Constitution going that far. You tying the executive, obliging the executive to adopt individual complaints procedures internationally and once adopted, never ever to, the, to revoke them again. I think that would be very far reaching. But I think the way in which this happened, that, that there was a suspension of pending proceedings and so on, that maybe something could be constructed here. I guess Dere would disagree with that too. But, um, I also think that there's just such a general dissatisfaction amongst the courts at the moment with the government. There's quite an outrage among, uh, amongst the judiciary about how certain procedures are handled by government that if they can somehow find an argument that is more or less convincing, I think they may actually buy into this. But I do think that they have their work cut out for them. And I will stop there so that we can hear what our other colleagues have to say. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Erica. Just oh. long, just long last note. <laughs> One sentence, just to summarize, we are left here in the final analysis now with a huge problem because states don't have anywhere to go with their disputes under some of the protocols. Individuals and others with pending disputes just, you know, they've just been frozen in time. And the SADC employees all have to trot over to the uh, Botswana High Court which has uh, declared itself obviously willing to deal with these cases, but I don't think that that is long-term the best option either. Now I'm done, thank you. Th thank you very much. I propose we do a first round of common, uh, comments, and we start with Dere, who I should mention, uh, also held the position of principal state law advisor at the Department of International Relations and Cooperation of South Africa, which might have influenced uh, his, his thinking about these topics.
then we will have Laurent comment on it, and then I hope to get some historical pr uh, perspective from Sir Francis, who I should mention, besides uh, just being an advocate general, one of his most famous opinions was on access of individuals to the ECJ, if I'm not mistaken, Union de Pequeños Agricultores, um, which is continuously being read and reread and, re and influenced the current shape of the EU treaties and is still being cited even in the Inuit case. So, Dire. Thank you very much. I will be brief. I didn't prepare anything. I thought I would do a real comment. I know normally when people are asked to do comments, they prepare something beforehand. I, so I absolutely didn't prepare anything, but I did, in the course of listening to the presentation, take down some notes. I hope I'll be able to read everything and make sense mm -hmm. of it. Uh, and I also hope it'll be uh, coherent as I sort of go through it. Um, I should start, I think, at the beginning just to dispel a myth. Um, I, I think that it was um, quite unfortunate what happened to the Sadiq Tribunal. I think I should say that at the beginning because a few of the things I might say and a few of the things you've already heard might suggest that I think it was a good thing that, that it was um, suspended, disbanded, or whatever it was um, that's happened because I think even that is a critical question. Exactly what happened to the Sadiq Tribunal? Was it suspended? Was it disbanded? Was it amended? Um, um, so, so as long as you sort of hear at the beginning that I think um, that it was unfortunate what happened to the Sadiq Tribunal. Um, now, Erika began, of course, by reminding us of the good old days when uh, we were all filled with hope about the future. Uh, the wall in the city where I'm currently based uh, was tumbling down. Apartheid was coming near an end. Uh, the Cold War was coming to an end. It seemed as if uh, we were headed to a bright and wonderful world where human rights would be respected and all would be lovely and we would hold hands and sing Kumbaya. Um, as it turns out, things haven't quite worked out that way. Um, but I think one of the things that, that certainly I worry about, and I never thought I would hear myself say this, is I do worry about the extent to which sort of uh, human rights law human rights thinking um, has, has not influenced but has almost sort of taken over um, international law to the extent that I don't know if there is an international law left. It seems to me that when you think about everything, all that you need to think about to determine what is in terms of law, right or wrong, you, you need to ask yourself, was that a bad decision or was that a good decision? And if you come to the conclusion that it was a bad decision, then it's automatically unlawful. Um, we see that in a lot of ways, in a lot of the discussions that are taking place, not only with respect to SADC, but also, for example, with respect to the ICC. And, and I won't go there, but I think that's, that's certainly one of the, um, um, the critical issues, which leads me to make two very broad points um, before making specific comments on the issues that you've raised. I mean, the one issue is, is the complete ignorance of rules relating to interpretation, or at best, you could say sort of um, an overexpensive interpretation of um, uh, on the particular treaties. Campbell case is an example of that. I mean, if, if you adopt the approach that was taken in Campbell, um, then essentially you don't need a human rights treaty. I mean, all that you need is you need a clause in a treaty that says states shall act in accordance with, the human, with human rights and the rule of law and democracy. Then voila, you have reproduced with that one sentence, you have reproduced the, uh, the ICCPR, you've, in, um, and you've reproduced uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, you've reproduced the ICSCR, you've reproduced uh, CEDO, you've reproduced all of these instruments. I think that's problematic. Um, I think that's problematic. And I'll come back to Article 28 because I think you also see this in sort of um, the fallout. Um, the other issue um, that I, all right, and this is the second broad point, um, which I think is also related to, to, um, to the human rights movement um, and how it's taking over international law. I also wonder if the proliferation of international courts and tribunals, 
um, of whatever sort is also not affecting the coherence of the legal system. Um, I don't know some of the decisions that are being made by, um, by international courts. Um, we will talk about Lugmyandu in a little bit, but the, the conclusion that Lugmyandu, um, the African Commission on Human Rights, um, on Human and People's Rights, reached with respect to state responsibility uh, might be correct, uh, but I don't think it is, and it's certainly not reasoned sufficiently to make such an important point about the circumstances under which a state will assume responsibility for what is essentially the conduct of an international organization. I mean, there's very little reasoning. And in fairness to Lukumyandu, the court recognizes that it's on very thin ground here, and it says, well, it's making this point, recognizing that it didn't receive um, sufficient arguments on this. Um, the Swiss Borg arbitration that you mentioned um, also raises very interesting issues about jurisdiction. And you mentioned, I'm glad you mentioned, that it would be very strange, or you, at least that you found it strange, the arguments, and they weren't quite clear to you. I was indirectly involved in that, and the arguments, quite frankly, aren't very clear to me, yet I suspect that the, the, um, the arbitral tribunal will find that it has some jurisdiction. Um, now, what, what happened to the Sadiq Tribunal? Was it suspended? Um, and what is the fate of, of um, the pending cases? Are they frozen? I mean, they're certainly frozen. The question is whether there is any hope of them seeing the light of day. Um, and I think there is. The Sadiq summit, at least at the last summit, um, was considering precisely what to do with those, um, those particular cases. Now, of course, um, Zimbabwe's argument was, well, that particular tribunal is over, and so the Sadiq summit should not involve itself in that. But there were certainly a fair number of states that were saying, um, in the interest of political justice, as a matter of legal justice, um, the Sadiq summit must think of a way in which to allow sort of these cases to, to be heard. Uh, the key question, I think, is whether or not the process that was undertaken was lawful or not. And as you mentioned, in terms of the, the, um, the, uh, um, both the SADC uh, treaty and also the, the protocol establishing the tribunal, uh, states and the summit were f fully within their right to do whatever they wanted to do with um, um, the tribunal amended, um, which I would say, as I think what happened, I mean, I think what happened was it wasn't disbanded because there was never a decision to disband. It was suspend. Well, um, the first thing that happened was that new judges weren't appointed. And then when the terms of the sitting judges came to an end, um, they weren't appointed. And the result was then that the summit, or, or rather the tribunal, couldn't sit. Um, but there was never a decision that was taken to terminate it, and so it's still practically in existence. It's just, well, it, it, um, it can't work. Um, but bear in mind that the summit um, is fully capable of disbanding it, of amending it. And I think what happened, if you look at the overall scheme of things, is that the, 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 the protocol establishing... Um, um, the tribunal was amended. Now, the question is, did they go through the correct procedure, right? The key question here is the two-thirds majority. I think that's the only thing really that's missing. I mean, there's, there are issues about the time frames, when the proposal must be made. Um, but the real important question is the question of the threshold of majority that's required. And the threshold of majority that's required is two-thirds. Um, it's very interesting if you make the argument that because it wasn't a two-thirds majority, i.e. there wasn't a vote, where states said, yeah, 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 I vote yes, or I, I vote no, and so you didn't technically reach a two-thirds majority, but what you did have was you had consensus, else, right? Yeah. Um, and, and which, again, raises the question whether or not that's, that means unanimity, and here, um, um, Holoran and I have very different views on whether or not consensus means um, um, unanimity. Now, in terms of the rules of procedure of the sum, in fact, no, uh, in terms of the the practice 
outcome of the summit. Um, and in terms of the rules of procedure, essentially all decisions are taken by consensus. I mean, that's, that's essentially the practice. Um, it's, if, you, if you go through the decisions of Mossadegh, at least those that are available, because it's also not a particularly um, uh, well-resourced um, website, so it's hard to get all the decisions, but if you go through those decisions that are available, decisions are generally taken by consensus. In fact, I couldn't find a single decision that was not taken by consensus. They all seem to be taken by consensus, even when the instrument provide for very specific things. And by the way, that's one of the key issues that Zimbabwe raised with respect to some of the amendments to the SADC protocol, which led to all the problems. I mean, they were arguing that that this is unacceptable because the amendments were not done in terms of the rules in um, in in um, in um, um, in the protocol itself. Uh, one of the fallouts. Now you mentioned, of course, um, this this case that's currently um, being heard in uh, with respect to Lesotho, uh, the Swiss um, diamond mining case. case. Um, and here the argument essentially that's being made is that Lesotho is responsible as a state for the decisions that were taken by the Sadiq Tribunal because it didn't oppose the decision, right? And so the idea is that consensus means unanimity, means that as soon as you accept the decision or as soon as you don't object to the decision, it means that you agree to it and therefore assume responsibility, assume individual responsibility for that. And I think that's a... That's a, that's, a, that's a stretch to make. Um, it's a stretch to make because um, very often states simply agree to, or, or rather um, uh, don't block consensus simply because they don't have a strong view on an issue, not because they agree with its content. Um, sometimes states aren't even there in the room when the decision is made um, to, a, to to reach the conclusion that by joining consensus, not only do you agree, but in fact you're, you would be held responsible, um, I think would be a very dangerous proposition um, to make. But more importantly, as a matter of law, if one looks at the SADC Treaty, where the SADC Treaty wants to talk about unanimity, it in fact does so. It says that such and such decision will be taken by unanimity. Um, and this applies only with respect to the admission of new members not with respect to other questions where consensus is used. And so the question then becomes, well, what does consensus mean? Um, Lake Nyandu, uh, the case there was very interesting. The, the African Commission um, a decision in, in Lake Nyandu was very interesting. I think it was correct, as you mentioned, uh, it was correct, as you mentioned, uh, that, that Lake Nyandu's, or Luke Nyandu's um, interpretation of articles uh, seven of the African Charter was that they apply, or rather the rule of law and access to remedy applies to domestic remedies um, and not to um, uh, um, international remedies so that the disbanding or the suspension or whatever it was um, of SADC couldn't be a violation of um, the African Charter. By the same token, I think it would be very difficult to make the argument that the disbanding of the Sadiq Tribunal would be a violation of Articles 4C and 6.1 of the Sadiq Tribunal, which in fact is what is being argued um, in the Swissburg Tribunal. Um, which is what exactly? Which is precisely what is being argued in the Swissburg Diamond Mining case. That, that um, the, the question you asked is, what is the substantive basis for jurisdiction? Yeah. Right? Because you can't rely on the investment tribunal for that. You have to rely on some substantive issue. You have to say, well, because the investment tribunal requires there to be an investment, and the investment must be violated. And so the question is, what, what right has been violated? What investment right has been violated? And the investment right that is being advanced in that case is Articles 4C and 6.1 of, um, no, of the tribunal itself. Which says, so, sorry, yeah, uh, yeah, which is of human the treaty. Rights. exactly, uh, which is not an investment. But again, I suspect that that the tribunal will find that it has jurisdiction. And again, this goes to the question of the extent to which tribunals find themselves constrained um, by law. One argument. Um, now, here I am straying a little bit because you mentioned that perhaps I shouldn't, or I, I, I 
I feel a little constrained in going into too many details on this, but one argument that has been made, interestingly not by the parties, but, but it seems by um, the tribunal itself, is to rely on um, fair and equitable treatment, which is in the investment protocol. But again, if you look at the text of the investment protocol, it talks about fair and equitable treatment in the domestic system, right? It's not fair and equitable treatment internationally. So it's, it would be about whether or not there was access to judicial processes in Lesotho or in Zimbabwe or in South Africa, or whatever the case may be. Um, that's the, the essence of, uh, um, of Article 28 that you referred to. Just one last comment, and this is on the FIC case, which I, mean, I agree with you. I think it was a very well-reasoned case, both in the Supreme Court of Appeal and in the Constitutional Court. Um, my, my only worry, though, is I think that the court essentially um, dodges or voids the real international law questions. And these are the real international law questions that were raised by um, the, the Zimbabwean lawyers. And essentially, these arguments are that it never ratified, it never agreed to the amendments that were made to the SADC tribunal protocol. Um, and the court essentially says, well, you didn't make those arguments in initially, and therefore we won't entertain them. And I think the court should have entertained those because I think they are valid arguments, and maybe um, um, the court may have, may have um, been able to address them. Just one last point, and this is sort of the consequences of of courts and tribunals not feeling constrained by the treaties that establish them. I think the consequences are going to be that courts are going to be extra, I mean, sorry, states are going to be extra cautious about what they put in treaties, and in the long run, it's going to negatively affect the growth in human rights because states are going to know that courts and tribunals are going to give an overly expensive interpretations to the provisions that they come to. Um, and that would make them think twice before including any human rights language in a treaty, and I think that would be um, said. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tire. Next up, Laurent. Yeah, thanks. Uh, this has all been uh, really fascinating. Uh, Holger referred to a report that I wrote. I should just say I spent a, a good number of months in 2011 uh, writing a report at the request of uh, SADC itself, it followed on from the Campbell case, and essentially the politics of it um, were that, uh, to put it in a nutshell, uh, Zimbabwe <coughs> wanted me to say in my report that the SADC tribunal was illegally constituted, uh, and everybody else at that point, uh, as I understood it, although it didn't turn out that way, wanted me to tell Zimbabwe to comply with its obligations. Um, I ended up plumping for the latter, but Zimbabwe did have certain, uh, certain good arguments. It, it wasn't a, a complete slam dunk, but I did decide in the end. The result of that was uh, that the report, and made other report also said a lot of uh, te technical stuff about um, appointment and other budget, other things to do. With it. Um, the report was then adopted by the uh, justice, uh, but then the heads of so they were good enough to refer to this report in the preamble of the new 2014 um, unadopted protocol. The process of writing the report was fascinating and um, it was clear to me that it was an EU model, uh, as Erica said. Um, that's because uh, I discovered more recently there was a famous EU lawyer who wrote the, uh, or at least advised on a person who is not necessarily not in this room at the moment. <laughs> um, uh, and so in a sense I was following in someone else's footsteps. Now, I just want to make one point uh, about this, which is that part of my job when I did this, and I was talking to people in the region, I had a, a, a group of um, lawyers in the region who went to speak to member states, other stakeholders, uh, civil society as much as um, possible uh, university people uh, in the member states. One of the things that came out very strongly was that no one had the faintest idea what static law was um, in terms of its relationship with national law. It's easy enough to look at a treaty. Well, actually, that's not so easy in this case either. Well, a couple of things say about Article 4 and 6. But 
uh, how Sadiq law relates to the domestic um, uh, uh, laws of the different member states. That was something that nobody really had much idea about. And in fact, the Sadiq treaty isn't 100% clear. What it did do, which is very much on the EU model, was it established a protocol as well, I think, um, a system of references for preliminary rulings. Now, of course, that only really makes sense if Sadiq law um, has a very close connection. Quite how close, I guess, can be based a little bit, but a very close connection with domestic law. But nobody saw it that way. Everybody saw it as um, uh, just international law, it didn't have much connection with national law, and in fact, uh, everybody who um, answered my questions, which wasn't everybody, on what the reference for preliminary rules procedure was, <coughs> thought that it was to do with injunctions. Was, was completely wrong. So the level of knowledge of SADC, I mean, it was a little bit like if someone had said, write a report on EU law in, uh, you know, on the 2nd of January 1958 or something. Nobody really knew what it was at this point. So there was, there's a lot of, I think, education that needs to be done within the region just to get the, um, even leaving aside the tribunals, to, to, to understand what, what is there. There are lots of side instruments. Erica mentioned some protocols, left, right, and center. What do they actually mean for the member I, My impression was that people don't really know. Um, and of course, the tribunal now uh, being, um, uh, well, in a state of suspension, let's say. Uh, of course, that you know you don't have that motor for um, member states. Anyway, so that, that I just want to say something about the the analogy of EU law. And it, it, it's, it's not hypothetical at all. I mean, it's very real. Uh, what what does it actually mean? Um, so, uh, a few other points then. One um, is to do with the role of human rights and what, what are human rights. Was Campbell rightly decided? I think Campbell was rightly decided, actually. I disagree uh, with uh, Dira. And uh, I wouldn't go as far as to say all parts of it were rightly decided. Um, but this is on the specific point. I mean, the crucial article, I think, is Article 6.2. It's entirely ironic because 6.2 says member states shall not discriminate uh, on a whole list of reasons. Now, the irony, of course, is that that was there because SADC originates as an anti-apartheid movement. So nobody in their right minds would have imagined back in 1992 mm. that this would ever be turned uh, uh, in, in reverse, really, to protect a white farmer whose own background is interesting in this respect because it turns out that he's a South African originally who came to Zimbabwe as part of the South African Armed Forces liked what he saw and decided to set up shops there and move there. So I mean, the history is, is, is fascinating. Now, I don't know whether the decision on whether the, what the, South Afri uh, the Zimbabweans were doing constituted racial discrimination. I don't know if that argument um, necessarily stands up. It was a split two one decision on that. I mean, one can argue this in different ways. But the idea that uh, Article 6.2 can be wished away, I think, is fantastic. I mean, it's a very clear, strong, binding provision on racial discrimination. Now, we then have Article uh, 4C, which Jura uh, was talking about. The uh, member states and SADC shall act in accordance with human rights principles, etc., etc., etc. I don't see the problem with that. That's pretty much what it says in the EU Treaty. And uh, even before it said that in the EU Treaty, human rights found their way uh, in via a somewhat um, famous and uh, you know, unpredictable, at the time, unpredictable means, I think. But to say that a, a state has to act in accordance with human rights principles, the fact that those human rights principles might be elaborated by reference to uh, other binding, other binding international instruments that talk about this in more detail, I don't see as a big deal at all. I mean, I, I just don't see it. Now, there was a further aspect of Campbell which I didn't really think was good, which was to make uh, something of the objectives of the treaty and to get the hard core rules out of the objectives of the Senate treaty. And I think that, that went a little bit far. But on these two points, I really couldn't see um, and don't see uh, much of a problem. You know, reasonable minds uh, can obviously differ on this point. Now, um, the next thing I wanted to talk about a little bit, a, a small point, um, but connected with that, uh, Erica mentioned Article 21B, and, and she said that um, uh, this was a normal uh, applicable law provision, which says you read uh, uh, treaties in light of other international law and so on, I don't, and, I, and that I didn't think that it, was, it stopped there. Uh, and I'll, I'll explain why, because what 21B says is that the, well, I mean, it still says, uh, 
um, is that the tribunal shall develop its own community jurisprudence. Now, that uh, direction to develop jurisprudence, I think, goes well beyond. I mean, of course, it's what courts all do, right? Um, but they pretend that they don't. Uh, in this particular case, this is actually saying make it up. You know? I mean, I've never seen an applicable law clause that says make up the law. Uh, so I think that's, that's unusual um, in that respect. <laughs> now, as you mentioned in your slide, this is all gone, right? There's nothing of this. And in fact, all that's left when it comes to applicable law, which of course is, um, you know, the connection between applicable law and jurisdiction is, um, is uh, that the tribunal, uh, the new envisaged tribunal, can only talk about the interpretation of SADC law uh, in relation to disputes between member states. I mean, that's interesting in itself. Why get rid of an application? I mean, every applicable law clause in the world says interpretation and application. And you need to have that because the difference, of course, is that interpretation is essentially you're dealing with hypothetical facts and application is those facts you know, made flesh. Um, you can't have, a, I mean, you can have a, a point uh, simply to do with interpretation, but I can't see how you can have a point to do with interpretation and at the same time be talking about a real dispute. That doesn't seem to me, uh, but it's a minor point. I know why it's there. It was an instruction in a, in a summit communique and clearly uh, the, the people drafting the treaty thought it was safer just to uh, buy it rather than, um, you know, uh, quite with a more standard form political law clause. That's, of course, um, uh, a matter of political controversy, because the more you, you uh, say with old 21B, you say to the tribunal, you can make things up, the more they will, and the more human rights is likely to find its way in. Although I don't think it found its way in via 21B in the case um, at hand. So that's a small point on the uh, uh, jurisdiction and applicable law issue. Then, uh, when it comes to suspension, um, yeah, I think I agree with Dira. I'm not so sure that uh, the tribunal has been suspended, actually. I think mainly what's I mean, Summit talks about it, but um, I'm not sure that there's a clear decision, actually. I mean, they say uh, things like that. I'm not sure there's a clear decision on whether to uh, suspend. What has been done is two things. One is that the judges were never appointed, or not reappointed. So it just uh, didn't exist. And then the, nom the procedure is that member states nominate judges. If they don't nominate judges, you end up with no functioning tribunal, a little bit like NAFTA tribunal from the state aspect of that. Um, so there's no real violation. There's no obligation to um, appoint judges. The other thing which is interesting, and this is maybe a little bit different, is the idea, or the, I don't know quite how to describe this, but uh, the, what has happened is non-registration uh, of new disputes, except for Swissborough um, Mines, which was actually registered by the registrar, Judge Makandawira, uh, after the apparent, uh, you know, summit statement, I think. Um, uh, uh, suspending the tribunal, that was a bit of a controversial um, a thing for him to have done there. So, I don't know, but if we say that there was a decision to suspend, I mean, I'm not taking a firm view on this, maybe one can say that, I don't see what the problem is. I don't think it's illegal uh, at all. And there's an irony here which is worth pointing out, which is all of Zimbabwe's arguments at the time about why the 2001 protocol uh, weren't, uh, wasn't in force have now been turned around for the enemies of Zimbabwe, if I can uh, use that term colloquially, because it's all exactly the same stuff. The, um, what Zimbabwe said at the time was uh, Article 36 of the SADC Treaty, which talks about amendment, hadn't been fo uh, followed properly, um, in part because the need, I mean, the real problem there, the, 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 the majority is not not so much the problem. The problem is that uh, the uh, proposal to amend the treaty has to be from a member state going to the executive secretary and then that, and that hadn't been done. But then that had never been done. Um, in static practice, so exactly. uh, yeah, it's not a big deal. I think that you just say, uh, you know, subsequent practice changed that. And then Zimbabwe said, well, um, uh, but the protocol wasn't in effect because it wasn't uh, wasn't ratified. Because it didn't need to really be ratified because it was a decision under Art Article 36. So, for exactly the same reason, if I think if there is a summit decision, if one, if one says there is a decision to suspend or not to appoint judges or whatever it is. Um, I really don't see why uh, that is not um, that is not lawful. I mean, the only way I think that, that could be made not lawful is if you uh, 
talk about um, a denial of justice or something. Uh, you know, you've taken away uh, Swiss whisperer's rights, effectively. Now, I don't know whether that works in international organisations. I don't think it's that straightforward. I mean, mm. it's um, uh, not clear to me. Um, but then no one's paying me to say the opposite, which I happily do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, that's what I think about uh, the suspension. Now, um, uh, another um, point uh, is to do with consensus. Why not consensus? Let's talk about that. I mean, I, I, my view on consensus is, and it's in the report, uh, is pretty simple. Uh, and it comes from the footnote in the WTO agreement, which talks about consensus, and there are other places too. And it's, um, it's not unanimity uh, at all. It's, it's a cut-down form of unanimity, which means um, it's just non-veto. So it doesn't mean everybody... It's not positive unanimity. It's, it's, you could say negative unanimity in the sense that if you don't object um, and you have uh, a majority then I think uh, that to me sounds like consensus. And, and really the only place uh, that I found uh, that says something different is in this wonderful advisory opinion of the East African Court, uh, advisory <laughs> opinion 1 slash 2008, um, which uh, is remarkable uh, because in order to come up with the result that consensus means majority, the court <laughs> quoted Wikipedia. <laughs> now, <laughs> It did. Yeah. It did. Now, I don't know if anyone's done a, an IP address hunt uh, for <laughs> when that particular Wikipedia entry was uh, changed, but I think any arbitrator in search of a source of authority could do, could do worse than uh, rely on uh, Wikipedia. Not much worse, though. Um. <laughs> so uh, that's, uh, I think, my, my main comments. Hopefully that'll spark a bit of uh, disagreement. I wonder if one thing maybe you can uh, confirm for me. Uh, Fick, um, uh, wasn't that all about lawyers' fees? No, partly. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I'm... I'm okay, uh, sadly, um, we, we, we continue with the, with, with the procedure. The international lawyer in me wants to discuss consensus and uh, wants to discuss a lot of the problems here. Uh, but the European lawyer in me says uh, a lot of the developments, uh, like human rights in international courts and tribunals, that's, the, of course, the ECJ grasping from general principles in Stauder, Internationale Handelsgesellschaft, and developing a human rights jurisprudence out of, well, uh, pretty much nothing in the treaties. And so uh, we should turn over to the person who is not necessarily not in the room. Uh, that was the wording. Uh, Sir Francis, we'd be grateful for your input. Thank you, yes. Well, may I um, yeah, I'll just take a, a few minutes, to be very brief, uh, to say a word about the origins of the Salic Tribunal, because I happen to have been involved in that, and I think it's of interest in the context of our discussion today. Um, in fact, it may also be of interest because I had visits from researchers into the Salic Tribunal who told me that there was no material available on the origins of the Salic Tribunal. That's right. But from my point of view, the story started almost exactly 20 years ago when I was an African general of the uh, European Court of Justice. And the president of the court came to see me with a letter from the executive secretary of SADC, who was um, Dr. Kari Mbwende. The letter was headed, the establishment of the SADC tribunal slash court. Uh, essentially, it asked for my assistance as a consultant in the establishment of the tribunal. And I think what is of interest today is the remarkable ambition of the project at that time. The letter <coughs> stated that the aim of SADC was to establish a court slash tribunal with similar competences and capacity to those of the European court. So it wasn't entirely my own um, invention. Um, to that end, they proposed that I should undertake an elaborate study which would include reports on other transnational courts and tribunals around the world and the preparation of a draft statute for the tribunal. I would act as a consultant together with an administrator. As it turned out, the other consultant was not an administrator, but Professor Camber, who was dean of the law faculty of the University of Namibia. Um, 
uh, took over some of the work towards the end of our consultancy. Uh, I don't know why they approached me uh, to undertake the work, but I did have a particular interest in transnational courts, including those set up by other regional organizations in Africa. I'd also acted as a consultant for a projected court envisaged by President Gorbachev uh, at that time, and, or shortly before, in a new community modeled on the European community, which was to replace the Soviet Union with a community based on the rule of law, a project which was regrettably very short-lived. Uh, for the Senate Tribunal, uh, I could not take on the full study which had been proposed, but I agreed to advise on the project, and in due course I produced a report and a draft protocol setting out some ideas. In particular, I thought it best that as the letter had envisaged, the Tribunal should have a wide jurisdiction. I favoured also access for individuals to the Tribunal. I also thought that in the light of the experience of other courts and tribunals, the tribunal would function best and perhaps attract stronger members if it had a broad jurisdiction and a significant caseload. Incidentally, I recall that I also proposed that the tribunal should have a specific human rights jurisdiction, but there was a difference of opinion there, and Professor Campbell, I remember in particular, thought it would be very difficult to identify the content of human rights although, of course, there are examples of courts being able to do this without a very clear textual basis. <laughs> so I drafted the protocol, um, the agreement setting out the main provisions governing the tribunal, reflecting those ideas, and although the draft was subsequently amended, the tribunal was initially given a wide jurisdiction, which corresponded largely to the draft. So the jurisdiction included disputes between member states, actions by natural and legal persons against states, subject to the exhaustion of domestic remedies, preliminary rulings, as has been mentioned, on references from national courts, disputes between member states and the community, and disputes between national and legal persons and the community. And those were set out in Articles 15 to 18 of the protocol in its initial form. As we know, and as we've heard, the jurisdiction was subsequently much reduced, the rest, as they say, is history, but I hope that that very brief account of the origins may be of some interest by way of background. Thank you very much. And I, actually, there is now a, a, a Soviet, well, former Soviet region community court. I have no idea to what extent they are based on your work, but it, it's now in existence. Yes, yes. Um, I'm afraid that is only um, a union in name, including Russia, with some of the more uh, retrograde uh, republics the former Soviet Union, whereas the Gorbachev project was to have the entire states, which were original members of the Soviet Union, together even with the Baltic states, which although they were by then liberated, were still interested in joining such a community based on war. And that was a rather striking period, but gave nothing. Thank you so much. I, I would propose the following, because we do also have wine in the other room, and it would be unfortunate to let it go to waste. I uh, propose that we will have final statements, because the reception will only last until 7 o'clock. Uh, so Erica, of course, would go first, and then uh, both of the discussants would have another opportunity to get final statement. Okay. And we will, if you try to keep it to two minutes. Yeah, sure. Three very brief points. When it comes to the issue of whether uh, uh, Article 6, non-discrimination, I entirely agree that it was very clearly articulated. But the one thing that is still bugging me about that article, it is not articulated as a human right. It is not written, it, it's not an individual right as it stands there. It, I'm not saying that the, Sadiq, uh, the, that the Campbell decision was wrongly decided in granting an individual right. But I do think Zimbabwe could have ma made more of that point, that if, if this was an individual right to non-discrimination, as opposed to a mere guiding principle, why then was it distinctly differently formulated and articulated than what you will find in human rights treaties? Uh, second, the, uh, apart from the fact that uh, the Zimbabwe's arguments about the 2001 treaty not 
having been illegal and never having entered into force and therefore the tribunal was illegal and so forth. Its own Supreme Court rejected that out of hand. The Gramara case. Apart from all the arguments that Laurent has already mentioned here, the Gramara case explicitly also, it was quite scathing in that part of the judgment, spelling out the fact that Zimbabwe would have been stopped from arguing that because it has actually relied on that treaty which it now claims illegal in several instances and it's actually supported, it appointed judges, it paid judges and so on. The, uh, its behavior up, up till that point in, in terms of whether that treaty was legal, whether the creation of the tribunal was legal, contradicts entirely this claim that, that it never came to existence. It supported all of that until it took a decision that it wasn't uh, in, in agreement with. I would like, Overwine, to hear from the gentleman, so why, why all this big debate about consensus? If we have consensus that leads to a binding decision, clearly that has legal consequences. Um, now, I agree, can understand that the consequences can be attributed to the organization as opposed to the state. I, I'm not sure whether that is where the disagreement comes in. But whether it's consensus or majority, if there is a binding decision, clearly there has to be legal consequences. Or, you know, what's the point? What am I missing here? And finally, I don't think it is helpful to think that if you have a dysfunctional state which doesn't respect the rule of law on the national level and respect the decisions of its own courts on the domestic level, you'll have any more success if you push all those cases to the regional level. The reason why the European Union is still functioning despite all the challenges is because for most of the member states are functioning democracies that respect the rule of law and accept decisions coming from uh, uh, the European Court of Justice, even the United Kingdom, for the time being while they're still in the, in the EU. Uh, that is why it works. You have a democratic, you have states that more or less function as they should. We don't have that in SADC, and it's not going to help to push all these human rights disputes to the regional level because they still have to be implemented domestically, and that's where things need to be fixed. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I'll also just make three quick points. Um, the first point is I, I share much of what you said in really? your second round. Um, I do think that, uh, that the elevation of these burdens to the international level is problematic, and this is in fact um, um, exactly what leads to um, an over-expansive interpretation. Um, and there is in fact an over-expansive interpretation. Um, my, my concern with the interpretations of Article 4C and 6.1 um, is not so much with non-discrimination, although I do agree with you that it's not worded, it's not phrased um, like a human right. It's also that you, you need to read all text in their context. And if you look at the context of the SADC Treaty, it's just simply not a human rights treaty. It's a treaty that constitutes an organization and is primarily geared at organizing how states within that organization um, um, behave. Um, the human rights aspects are aspirational, I think. Um, certainly arguments can be made, but those arguments require overexpensive interpretations. And here I take the opportunity to say, with respect to the Law Society of South Africa case against the president, I would not be surprised, in fact, uh, um, if the court finds that um, in fact it was unconstitutional for um, the, um, the president to, to participate. I think it would be wrong, but in fact, I'll be very surprised if they find, um, I mean, if they find otherwise. Um, and the second point is to say, with respect to the question of the level of knowledge, I mean, I, I, I absolutely agree with you that there is very little knowledge within SADC. Um, one of the interesting things is that on the consensus issue, and I'll come back to the consensus issue, is that reliance was placed on the fact that SADC states generally viewed consensus. If you spoke to them casually, generally viewed it as unanimity. Um, but there's very little understanding. Very few SADC member states even knew that there was a document called Rules of Procedure. I mean, even the legal advisors did not know that there was a document that was called Rules of Procedure, with, which um, I'm explained um, exactly how decisions um, were to be made. Now, on the, the, the consensus issue, the real question here, or um, the dispute relates to the extent to which each individual state okay, can be held responsible because you have 
done something. There's certainly legal consequences for the organization, but the extent to which each individual state, uh -huh. by joining consensus or by not objecting, is individually responsible. Uh, there are, in fact, cases and instances that show that consensus does not mean that you agree with the decision. Um, in NAM, for example, um, it's very clearly stated um, in the NAM rules of procedure um, that consensus means that you take all efforts to strive at an agreement, but that if a significant majority, significant majority agree, then a decision can be taken by consensus, even if there's an objection. If you look at the SADC practices, there are a number of decisions in which Zimbabwe in particular said, I cannot go along with it, right? But the decision was still taken. Um, you know, in UN practice, this is very interesting because in, in UN practice, consensus means that everybody is willing to agree. And so if one state objects, then there isn't consensus. But if you look at the, 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 the reasons for that that have often been given by um, the legal advisor's office, it is because in the UN system there is a right to vote. And so essentially by denying a state the right to veto a decision, you would be denying them the right to request a vote. And that's the only reason. Otherwise, it's clear that you would be able to reach consensus um, even if some states said, well, we object to that particular decision. I'll, I'll stop. Um, okay, well, I'll just make uh, two very quick points. One, in response to what Eric uh, said, and I agree with Dira on, on, on four um, uh, see, to some extent, it doesn't have to go that way. But all I would say is it can. I don't think it's a problem that it can. I think it's 50-50. But, it, but Erica makes a stronger claim, that, and I think Dira agrees with this, that Article 6.2 doesn't generate an individual right. Let me just read it out. SADC and member states shall not discriminate against any person on grounds of gender, religion, political views, race, ethnic origin, culture, or disability. And in particular, in, at the time when you have a tribunal with individual right of access to the court, I cannot see how, how that couldn't be read as an individual right. Compare, I was happy about the decision, but just compare it to how Article 26 of the ICCPR is articulated. And the principle of non-discrimination when articulated as a right always begins with everyone has the right to equality before the law or not to be discriminated. That, is what is, that's, that could have given Zimbabwe an angle here. I'm glad he did it, but I don't think that argument is outrageous. I do think that the way that Article 6 is articulated raises the question whether it articulates an individual right, because it deviates from the terminology normally used. I, I, uh, I don't think uh, EU practice would support that. I, I, yeah. um, or in fact, the, uh, what about the US Constitution? No, no state shall abridge, blah, blah, blah. International I mean, instruments. I mean, you can't look at national constitutions. Or you, you should rather look at international treaties, I would say. Oh, the fa I think the fact that the Universal Declaration uh, got a little bit rhetorical um, <laughs> when it came to that. I, I, yeah, anyway. okay. I, I think the key question is the context of the treaty. I, I, I think for me that's the most important. Except the context of this treaty was anti-apartheid. But once you have an individual right, I mean, what's the individual going to do there? And so even if you say that, that worked from 1992, until 2001. From 2001, there have to have been individual rights there, otherwise that may be. I, I would propose that... One last comment. <laughs> Just... <laughs> I have to think a little bit about context. I mean, I think there's a difference between context and the reason why it is. The context is based on the text. I mean, it is looking at the textual provisions and comparing them to one another. That's what context is. It's not the reason why the treaty oh, was okay, established. Yeah. Uh, but, but then there isn't any context. So this would be the... <laughs> oh, okay. This would be the moment to change our context. <laughs>
and move it to the, to, to the adjacent room. I'll just say I'm glad that we've reached consensus. <laughs> well, as consensus now is also a majority decision, I am very confused. <laughs> and um, I propose we move the discussion next door. I just wanted to point out one thing, because uh, when Lauren said uh, that it was difficult to find what national law and implementation meant, it reminded me of a project we did recently uh, in which Dire also wrote and uh, that was largely driven, but mostly driven, I should say, by Erika, um, a book we edited on the implementation of international law in Germany and South Africa, in which we split up all fields of international law into subfields and then assigned each, sub each subfield to a German scholar and a South African scholar to describe how uh, that particular field of law is implemented. And we did the same thing with regional law, only we focused on the AU. Uh, and there we had a similar issue, the implementation of EU law in the German context, which is now basically mostly EU law, and the implementation of AU law, which to a large extent for uh, my poor South African colleague was finding out what could be implemented. Uh, and uh, Apparently, large differences, whereas in all other fields, I think the differences were not that tremendous. Uh, but look it up to advertise this book here. Thank you very it's much for being here. Charge. It's free of charge, downloadable from the website of, as I know it's endearingly called, Pulp Nonfiction, uh, the Pretoria University Law, <laughs> Law Press, abbreviated to Pulp. Um, our next event will be next week with Judge Rüdiger Wolfram. Uh, thank you very much. Let's move it next door to the reception.